So uh, I think we can uh, we can slowly start uh, our meeting today for the Friday afternoon seminar. Uh, welcome everybody. So uh, this Friday we have the pleasure to listen to Nutan Demai. Uh, Nutan uh, has recently been moved to uh, IT University of Copenhagen, and uh, before that she was in uh, for a decade. Uh, uh, she had a position at the Technical University in Bombay, in India. And uh, uh, originally she did a PhD at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in, in Chennai. And between her employment in Bombay and the PhD, she had a period as a postdoc in, in, Tata, uh, in Tata company in India. And, um, and today we are very happy to, to hear about uh, uh, a, a, a longer presentation, which I suppose is based on her recent Best Paper Award at Fox uh, 2021, uh, titled Super Polynomial Lower Bounds Against Low Depth Algebraic Circuits. So, Nutan, uh, the stage is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, uh, let me interrupt you immediately because I forgot to say two important things. First thing, the meeting is recorded. So this is uh, Zoom uh, uh, said already this to the participants, but let's, uh, let's uh, record this again. And regarding questions, uh, Nutan would be very happy to take questions during the presentations. So everybody is encouraged just to interrupt, uh, hopefully uh, by speaking by voice. Uh, also, you can write a question in the chat and I will read it aloud. And final announcement, uh, if you are kindly uh, willing to turn your video on, this also will make everybody's experience more, uh, uh, more pressurable. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lorenzo. And um, so the plan for today uh, that I've drawn after discussing with everybody, uh, at, uh, uh, at least with a couple of you, is that uh, the, part is, uh, the talk is in three parts. And uh, in part one, I plan to give a gentle introduction to the area of algebraic complexity theory. And um, the, there I just don't talk about any new results. It's just uh, some background, basically. And in part two and three, I'll talk about our result. So in part two, I will uh, tell you the statements of the result. And uh, then uh, um, in part three, I'll try to give some proof details. And it's, um, I would like it to be like a, a Friday seminar. So I want all of you to kind of uh, relax and uh, sit back and listen, and of course ask questions. Uh, so I don't want to cram too many things. The more, more intention is just to communicate uh, clearly, as, as clearly as I can, and then, uh, of course, I'm very excited to talk to this group uh, overall because I think um, maybe there are there are different topics on which we can uh, talk later, right? So, uh, right. Okay, so let me get started. Um, when we talk about polynomials, uh, we are talking about these syntactic objects. So you have variables, and a polynomial basically will use variables and some field constants. And in our case, we are going to look at the field, uh, which is say complexes. So all the coefficients are from complexes. It's more about computing the polynomial itself. We don't worry about the complexity of these complexes here. So they are just given for free. And uh, there are two parameters of interest throughout. One is uh, the degree of the polynomial and the number of variables that the polynomial has. Okay. So as, a, uh, as I said, I would like to keep it, uh, at least start at a gentle pace. So for that, here is a nice example of a polynomial. Uh, what this polynomial does is, it takes subsets of variables from the universe, say of size capital N, and then for every subset, it multiplies all the variables from that set. This is supposed to indicate summation. This is supposed to indicate multiplication. And in order to compute this polynomial, we are using 
order of two to the n operations, because that's the number of sets we have from the universe n. But a little bit of thought tells us that actually the same polynomial can also be computed like so. Because what you can simply do is um, take every variable and add one to it and multiply all of them out. And now every subset of the underlying universe will get computed exactly once in this product. And uh, surprisingly, this only uses order n operations. And so this is fun because um, you have a polynomial which on the face of it looks uh, like may use a lot of operations to compute, but really if you think a little bit, it does not. And uh, this is the kind of question uh, algebraic complexity theory will try to answer, how difficult is it to compute a polynomial? And the difficulty is often measured in terms of these base operations I use. Like I said, it's not about evaluating the polynomial really. It's only about computing the polynomial. So it's not like I want to substitute uh, values for the variables and then compute the final uh, value that the overall operation computes. That, that's also an interesting question. That's also something people think about. But for now, we are only going to talk about computing this formal object, which is a polynomial. So this was an easy example. Let's look at another interesting example, which is not so uh, immediate, but maybe something that some of you have seen. So here is a polynomial that looks a lot like the polynomial we saw above. This is called the elementary symmetric polynomial. What this does is it takes subsets of variables, but of a specific size, say size D. So I parameterize this polynomial with D. And then for every such subset, it multiplies all the variables from there. And these are the monomials. It's quite easy to see that um, this can be computed using n choose d operations, because that's how many sets there are. Actually, this should be capital N. And um, now the question would be, is there another way to compute it, which is not this expensive? Just like over here, what, what we did over here. And it turns out that there is a trick that is very, very similar to the trick we saw above which will work here as well. So let me uh, create this temporary polynomial, which is on one extra variable. It uses all the original variables and this one extra variable, which is say t. And now I compute this polynomial. It's a lot like when we had a one here in the earlier case, but now it's t. Of course, this also uses order and operations. So that's quite uh, neat. What's interesting about this polynomial is that the elementary symmetric polynomial of degree D is a coefficient of T to the N minus D in this polynomial. That's, that's easy to see again. And now what then it, it then, then there is a very simple idea uh, called the interpolation idea, where now if I think of this polynomial as a polynomial which whose coefficients are coming from, whose coefficients are from, you know, ca capital X, and whose only variable is T, then it's a univariate polynomial in T, which I want to interpolate. And I want to figure out the coefficient of this univariate polynomial for degree uh, n minus d component. And that's not very difficult to do, actually, because interpolation for degree uh, a univariate polynomial of degree d, you can just do it by, uh, um, so sorry, this, the degree of this polynomial, degree of uh, g, is actually capital N. 
And so to interpolate a degree n polynomial, you just need n plus one points. So just take n plus one points and for every uh, value of this alpha, evaluate this polynomial at alpha one, alpha two, et cetera. And some linear combination of these will eventually compute uh, the d-degree polynomial. That's what interpolation does. It kind of uh, substitutes n plus one values for variables and then takes some sort of combinations of these. What those specific combinations are is less relevant for us, but let's say they are some beta one, beta two, et cetera, up to beta zero to beta n. So them put together, now this uh, for the appropriate choice of beta will be able to compute this polynomial. So, you know, what we did was again, the second example was a lot like this first example. Um, we were also able to uh, compute this polynomial, which on the surface seems to have a large circuit using slightly clever idea of interpolation. And we were able to compute it using far fewer operations now, because as we saw, this polynomial itself is a circuit. So, you know, this needs computation, but that computation is simply this one. So that's easy. That's not only order n operations. Then you have to scale it by some beta, and then you have to add all of them. So, you know, another, say, order n operations or so. So overall, vaguely speaking, we have polynomially many operations, and uh, it can be done using polynomially many operations. Right, so that but was, yeah. Let me ask you a question here. Yes, please. Uh, some comment on these alpha i's, so those are complex numbers, and um, in this model of computation, do you care about their complexity? Or and if so, can you say something about it? Yeah, so I throughout ignore the complexity of these constants. Um, I mean, th there are ways to care about it actually, and people do. But in this model of computation that we are uh, working with, uh, we will sort of think of them as unit costs. So every time I use a complex or a, any fee underlying field element, it's just constant amount of uh, effort for me. Okay, Nitin, may I ask a question? Yes. Okay. Um, so in what's on the screen right now, uh, you say it uses polynomial in capital N operations. Yes. Now, what we had a little bit above was uh, capital N to the D. Yes. Roughly, yeah? yeah? yeah. Yes. So uh, this is, of course, for fixed D, hmm. also polynomial. So I, I just want to, let's, I, I, I'll put it this way, ask about your language here, uh, in the sense, what does it mean? Yes, yes, well, that's a very good point, actually. So D, there are many parameter regimes where uh, the cost here and the cost here are sort of comparable. So if D is like constant. Yeah, but then right? n, uh, then polynomial in and capital it's all, n all, and all. n to the D is the same. Is the same, exactly, okay. exactly. But That's all I was asking you about. Yeah, Thank yeah, you very exactly. much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you could like your question has led to one comment, which would I'll just add, uh, which is that D could be pretty large compared to. So for example, D of course could be, it could be n over two. Yes, exactly. D could be, in this case, it could be n over two. In general, for any polynomial, D could be a parameter that could be completely independent of the underlying variables. So that's a, that's a good point. It could be n, it could be n, n I mean, n square doesn't make sense here, but for example, as uh, you were saying, n by two, even n, I mean, all these are parallel. Well, if it's n, it's okay, right? I mean, okay. <laughs> no worries. Good point. This one. Yeah, for this fall level, n equal to n also is okay. But for example, here already, if it was like log n, 
already this implementation is sort of not so nice. It's already more than polynomial. Yes. And to be very, very frank, if I did really careful analysis over here, I can nail down the constant sitting in the exponent of n also. So it's more like n, I mean, n square is also a bit much, could be less than that even, right? So, so now already at d equal to three, the other one is going to start becoming worse than this one and so on. But yeah, it's a very good question. Thanks for that. Yes, uh, okay. Uh, that's what I was thinking of actually. And you yeah, might yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're right. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. So let, now let's me go to the third example in my, um, uh, uh, in the slides. So here the polynomial is um, uh, called the iterated matrix multiplication polynomial. So let me explain this one. You have uh, the underlying set of variables, I think of it as being partitioned into D sets, X1, X2, et cetera, up to XD. And uh, by some abuse of notation, I will also refer to the matrices that these variables refer to as X1, X2, XD, just to avoid too many uh, variables floating around, right? So, what is X1? I think of X1 as a set of N square variables. And uh, X1 is completely disjoint from X2, is completely disjoint from XD and so on. And um, X1 has N square variables and I interpret them as the ijth vari variable in set X1 is the ijth entry of this matrix. So, you know, this these are the matrices. And the polynomial is the polynomial obtained by multiplying all these matrices. And multiplying all these matrices, what does it exactly do? Well, it computes another n cross n matrix here. And every entry of this matrix is a polynomial. It's a polynomial consisting of monomials, which look like uh, this. They take one variable from here, one variable from here, one variable from here and that's one monomial. And then it adds all such possible monomials corresponding to this entry and so on. So more specifically, the uh, one comma one -th entry, right? Suppose I, I decide to call the iterated matrix multiplication polynomial, the one comma one -th entry of this resultant polynomial, okay? Then what does it look like? It looks like, it takes the first one comma, so for every choice of I1 to ID minus one, it takes one comma I1 from the first variable, I1 comma I2 from the second variable, et cetera, up to ID minus one comma one in the last variable, in the last set of variables. And for all such choices of I1 to ID minus one, uh, it just puts all these monomials into the set. And uh, the obvious uh, upper bound for this is n to the order d. Maybe it's to be exact, maybe it's like n to the d minus one or something. Yeah, Nathan, Nathan sorry, uh, I'm uh, maybe confused. You just mean the multilinear, you know, the multilinear monomials. Yeah. In, so for the first uh, thing here, uh, capital X sub one, it's all, multilinear monomials in the variables in this subset X sub one? Uh, every, you, do you mean every entry of this matrix? Every entry of oh, the Well, I mean, if, it's a, if you look at it, I don't know what the matrix uh, notation is supposed to mean right now. Okay. Uh, I can tell you that actually. So suppose I had N was two, if it was a two cross two matrix, and I'm referring to the first one, then the entry is X1, 1, 1, X1, 1, 2, X1, 2, 1, X1, 2, 2. Yeah, but that's clear. Yeah, thanks. Uh, but uh, these are monomials, right? I mean, what's coming out of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Finally, when you multiply them out, you get monomials. Yeah, if I multiply, you 
multiply them out like a permanent or whatever. I mean, it's it's all, all these monomials. Yeah. That's what I mean. If you look at this in this way, you get all the multilinear monomials, all monomials in those variables. With yeah, but, but not all, right? Not all, because when you choose a variable from the first matrix, which is one comma I1, then for it to be a product term coming up in matrix multiplication, you must pick I1, I2. You can't pick any arbitrary index here. That's how matrix okay. multiplication uh, works, right? I got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. And uh, uh, in fact, you know, there is a very nice way to think about this also uh, about matrix multiplication, which is kind of more familiar for most of us, which is to think about matrix multiplication as a um, graph reachability question also. So let me tell you how. So imagine that I have a graph which has on every, it's a layered graph. Every layer of the graph has N vertices. One, two, ta da 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 N. One, two, et cetera, N. One, two, et cetera, N. And I have, I'm going to have D plus one layers like these. And then um, this is my first set of variables. And the way I add them is if there is a vertex I here and a vertex J here, I add an edge from I to J. And because this appears in the first layer, I, I put a one on the top and an I J here. And then maybe I have some edge from J to J prime. Then this will be labeled as two J J prime. In fact, this whole matrix can be thought of as the adjacency matrix of the complete bipartite graph between these two uh, layers. And then this as the complete bipartite adjacency matrix between this layer and so on. And then when I actually ask for matrix multiplication, it's like A star. You're just like multiplying the same matrix again and again, but now because every between every uh, consecutive layers, you have fresh variables. When I ask you, what is the entry here? It's really like in an automata, you go from one comma one, one vertex here, two vertex one here. And along the path that you take, you multiply all the variables that come along this path. That's one monomial here. That's why this constraint is coming up because when you take from uh, one directed edge, edge from this to this, the next directed edge along the path must emanate from the same vertex where you reached earlier, et cetera. And then what is this polynomial overall? It's all these monomials that go from, so it's a summation of all possible paths from one to one. And this is more like, what we do in automata and so on, right? Like all possible parts in an NFA or something. Yeah, like that. So, yeah. Uh, I'm exactly. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Sorry again. Uh, now, uh, I hope I understand this. Of course, uh, if you look at this, it's kind of a multi-partite graph and you look at all the paths from uh, the i's vertex in the first layer to the j's vertex in the last layer. Okay, yeah. Okay, now this is fine. Uh, I'm one, I'm a little bit confused right now because if we talk about variables in polynomial rings and so on in general, they are commutative. Here, it's not commutative. It, it is commutative in that this particular way of co computing it, puts first set of variables here and second set of variables here. But even if you sort of invert it, um, I mean, this computation you're saying must occur in a specific order, but really it's not true, right? Like for maybe the first layer has to be first layer, last layer has to be last layer, but everything else is really okay. So this is in fact commutative. 
Okay, I don't understand this because if I go from x1 to x2 and then to x3, or if I go from x1 to x3 and then to x2, right? Uh, I mean, if- But all of them are over here. So that's the point. So if I start okay. from- yeah. well, if you say so, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe I can explain later. If uh, others seem more clear about this, maybe we can. It's okay. No problem. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's no problem at all. Thank you. And uh, so what I'm going to say is, I call this way of computing iterated matrix multiplication the brute force approach. Okay, I, I refer to this as BF of x1 to xt, which we will use shortly. Okay. So this is not the only way to compute uh, iterated matrix multiplication. Uh, this ties in, into the question that was being asked as well. I could compute it as follows. I could take the first two matrices. I could come up with the you know, complete uh, multiplication of this. Then whatever is that matrix, I then multiply it with X3, et cetera, up to XD. And then finally look at the one comma one at entry of this. So if I were to visualize this, it can be thought of as, you know, there is this uh, tree-like structure where each box is like this multiplication of just two matrices. And at the leaves, I take first two matrices, I multiply them, and then that multiplies with the third one and so on. So that's one possible way of computing iterated matrix multiplication. Yet another way would be to do divide and conquer. So you take the first D by two matrices, last D by two matrices, and then you multiply them out. That's another way to do it. Yet another way to do it is, the divide and conquer doesn't necessarily have to chop it off at D by two, right? It could do weird cuts. So one way to do it, another way to do it would be, you take the first square root D of them, just brute force compute them. By brute force compute them, I mean, just write it as sum of monomials like here. Then do that for the next square root D of them and so on and so forth up to the last square root D of them. Each of this will give rise to one matrix, say M1, M2, M square root D. And now the square root D matrices does obtained, you do another brute force on. So what then this does is that you get like a, sum of product computation over here for each one of them. And that finally feeds into another sum of product computation over here. As a result, you get like a depth four circuit because you have a sum of products which then receives sum of products. Is this uh, making sense? And each one of them is dealing with a polynomial of square root D degree. So just like here, we had an end to the order D upper bound for each one of them, because there were like D of them and uh, N was the number of variables. Here we have end to the order square root D. So this is also an interesting uh, implementation of IMM. Uh, so I'm calling this IMM because this is called the iterated matrix multiplication polynomial. Okay, so this was another example I wanted to present. And uh, what's interesting here is the very naive skew computation gives rise to depth D. This divide and conquer, which divides exactly at degree D by two gives rise to log D depth. And if you are willing to go from size poly to something like growing in D, but not completely like N to the D, then you can get to intermediate sizes for intermediate depths. In general, in fact, you can do something like n to the d to the one by delta for uh, depth delta. Or order delta or something, yeah. Depth two delta maybe, yeah. Um, so this is possible. Right, so what, what I'm trying to do here is just present a few examples just to get used to algebraic computations. 
Now I talk about a polynomial, which is quite interesting, important, uh, but we will not look at its implementation. It's the determinant polynomial. What's the determinant polynomial? Here, the set of variables are only n square. You don't have like d sets of them, just one matrix with n square variables. And now you just take the determinant of this syntactic object. So you don't have constants like we usually do when we compute determinant, but we have variables. And when we do that, uh, by, the, uh, by, by the formula for determinant, we have that for every permutation of variables from one to n, uh, you have one term here, which is the sign of the permutation. And for that, uh, the monomial corresponding to that is whatever the permutation picks. So if the permutation maps one to two, two to three, three to four, et cetera, and, and n back to one, then the monomial corresponding to that sigma will be one, two, two, three, et cetera. And so for every uh, permutation. And what's known, which is interesting about this, is that you actually have really nice, interesting circuits for this. You have polynomial size circuits of log depth. I'm not going to tell you how the depth becomes log, but you can imagine it's something like divide and conquer. So Gaussian elimination, which is like a sequential algorithm, which can, you know, at one time, one row at a time can uh, sort of arrange, start arranging the determinant in the way we want. So Gaussian elimination can be thought of as a method that works in a sequential way. And then you can imagine that there is a way to parallelize this. And uh, that uh, is not very easy to describe, but it's indeed true, yeah, it exists. And um, so I'm not telling you how to do this, but I'm just stating that this is known. And so this is known for determinants. Determinants are easy to compute. And what's, what's true about all the four polynomials I just told you about is they're all easy to compute, where easiness is how many operations I use. And typically, if I can do it using polynomially many operations and arbitrary depth, then it's efficient for me. Okay. Now here is a close cousin of the determinant, which is the permanent where it's exactly like the determinant, except for the sign term, which is not present here. Um, permanents come up naturally in trying to compute number of perfect matchings in bipartite graphs and so on. It's an important polynomial for many, many reasons. Um, and already for this polynomial, uh, we do not know whether there are polynomial size circuits or not. And uh, in fact, that brings us to the question of VP versus VNP. So um, sometimes in fact, people just say that showing that permanent does not have small circuits um, is the VP versus VNP question. So even if I don't define anything from now on, that's already a definition for VP versus VNP question. So without me telling you what VP is, what VNP is, that question uh, to prove that this polynomial, permanent polynomial, does not have polynomial size circuits is already proving VP not equal to VNP. So that's one way of stating it. It's like saying, you know, satisfiability does not have polynomial uh, time algorithm. So permanent is like a, a complete problem for VNP. And to show that it has polynomial size circuits would imply that VP equals VNP. Your turn. Yeah. Can I interrupt? Uh, yes. I'm sorry for this, but um, okay. since nobody else is interrupting, so I'm sorry for this. Uh, but no, I agree with all of what you said. Uh, the the point is uh, way up uh, for the polynomials and all the things you said. You're looking at the polynomials as syntactic objects. Yeah. Now, of course, here with the evaluation of determinant and permanent, we are not talking about syntactic objects. Because if we spell out 
the permanent or the determinant, they are exponential size. But oh. the thing is, we look at a matrix with whatever values, scalar values, and compute permanent. Oh, so to sorry to interrupt, but uh, let me just uh, correct this misconception right here. So actually, we do talk about only polynomials, even now. So determinant, as you said, looks like this exponential size circuit, but so did iterated matrix multiplication. So did uh, uh, this, and then there were easy ways to implement it, right? Yes. In the, in the same way, determinant actually has ways of implementing it using small size circuits. Yeah, uh, you're looking at circuits. I am looking at circuits through. Yeah, that, that's, that's okay. I, I agree. I, I, I just thought I wanted to uh, stress that we are not looking at sort of sums of product uh, representations or things like that, which we are used with polynomials. Uh, that is exactly what we are talking about. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, that is exactly what we are talking about. What I'm trying to say here is, this is a sum of product representation, which is really huge. But there is another uh, sum of product representation, which I'm not going to tell you about uh, as to what it is, but it is also a sum of product representation. It has many sums and products yeah. and so on. And in fact, this turns out to be polysized. And it has some depth log squared or something like this. Yes. Exactly. That's right. That's absolutely right. But right. For we agree on this now. Yes, yes, thanks. Exactly. And then for permanent, if I try to compute it as a polynomial again, we are never computing the evaluation. This is something I want to be very clear about throughout. And uh, uh, when we talk about evaluation, I'll come to it. Uh, but in this case, all the five examples, we are trying to compute the polynomial as a syntactic object itself. And for permanent, so all the previous polynomials had huge representations. If I just thought of it as sum of products, but then if I allow for longer sum of products of sums of products of sums of products and so on, then you could have smaller representations is what we saw. For determinant, I didn't prove it, but just believe me that it exists. And for permanent, we do not know. So, and that's in fact the VP versus VNP question. But rather than leaving it just uh, this way, for this audience, I feel like I could present some definitions because uh, it's not a general talk, right? We are all theory people. So I think, uh, and I, I think we also decided that I should present some definitions here. So let me actually give you the formal uh, statement of what VP versus VNP is. And uh, that's also not very difficult to uh, explain really. So we say, let me define the class VP. We say that a polynomial is on n variables and of degree d is in VP if F has circuits of size polynomial in N. So the only strange thing here is the degree of the polynomial should be polynomial. Okay, because if you have um, repeated multiplications, then in polynomial size, which is also say polynomial in depth, you can compute degrees two to the poly n, polynomials of this degree. By just repeated squaring, you can quickly blow up the degree quite a bit. If, if you take a polynomial of degree one, multiply it with another polynomial of degree one, you get polynomial of degree two, but then you repeatedly square this polynomial and you get polynomials of degree four and eight and 16 very quickly. And uh, uh, so, if I just say polynomial size, then the degrees of the polynomials can blow up quite quickly. And that's not what VP computations allow for. Okay. All the five examples we saw earlier, the degrees were very much bounded. They were sort of related to yeah. the number of variables uh, in terms of polynomials. Ritan, I think if you uh, keep squaring, you get double exponential thing. Oh uh, yeah, I wrote it wrong, you're right, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, we are absolutely right. Thanks. It should be two to the two to the poly. Good catch, thanks. And uh, 
so so basically vp is a placeholder for uh, efficient computation that's what vp is so then formally what is vnp uh, vnp just first before thinking about what vnp is uh, just let's think about np because it's a lot like np um, so np is like can you guess an assignment for a satisfiability formula which makes it true the part that whether given a satisfying assignment and a formula whether this assignment satisfies the formula or not is a polynomial time computation but coming up with this assignment is the hard part so there's this guessing part and then verifying part and the verifying part is easy and guessing part is what makes a polynomial in np so it's a very similar uh, concept here we say that a polynomial is in vnp if there is a parameter m and an n plus m variate polynomial g of degree poly n in vp such that um for zero one substitutions of y1 to y m when i substitute a specific assignment of g1 uh, y1 to ym in uh, g i get one instance of g and i do this for all possible values of y1 to ym to come up with polynomial f if f can be written in this way then we say it is vnp so it is like often people say that np can be thought of as uh, there exists followed by p followed by p this is the guess and this is the verify it's similar here the there exists part is getting substituted by this large summation and then you have invocations of some easy to compute part in this case a, an easy to compute polynomial so the definition is sort of uh, designed to mimic this notion um it requires a proof to say that permanent is in vnp it's not immediate uh, it but it's a two line proof which i am not presenting here uh, one question where does it say that g is easy to compute uh, g is a polynomial in vp all ah, right okay sure yeah skip yeah 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 no that's important that's uh, that's a good point. uh may I ask uh, what are the inputs i mean the inputs are x1 through xn and y1 through ym right interrogation so something or what yeah so for g the inputs are x1 to xn and y1 to ym therefore it is a n plus m variate polynomial uh yeah uh okay now uh, for this so the idea is even though there may be exponentially many monomials if we take if we would take the sum product representation of the polynomial g mm -hmm. uh, there could be and there are in general of course exponentially many but uh, uh, there would be exponentially many such monomials but we don't take that we compute them in the first layers um so i i don't think i understand your question but let me just say what this definition is here one more time and then maybe it will clarify so what i'm trying to say is this part g is easy to compute it's a m plus n variate polynomial on these variables and this is easy to compute but you still need to substitute variables for these y1 to ym and do this 2 to the n times 2 to the m times right and this big summation now this is how the vnp polynomials are defined so every polynomial in vp is also in vnp right so for such polynomials obviously you will be able to do something clever and you know mix this with something else inside and do a clever computation but then there are polynomials like the permanent which you can represent this way but there is no easy way to write it in polynomial size uh, i'm not sure whether i answered your question but uh, 
let me know. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so these are just the definitions of VP and VNP. There is no nothing more to it really. And uh, therefore it is sometimes just easy to think of VNP as the permanent or sometimes like this. And uh, there's a very nice survey uh, by uh, Meena Mahajan, which I can point you to um, later. Uh, that I think she wrote in 2014, maybe, uh, where uh, she also works out these examples. For example, showing permanent is in VNP is a short proof, which is very nicely presented in the survey and so on. So it, after now that you know these definitions, it will be quite easy to quickly read that up later. All right. That's a very interesting question. So V in uh, VP and VNP, is it for value? Uh, this is <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, that's a very good question, actually. So uh, this was defined. So VP and VNP were defined by uh, Valiant uh, in um, 2009. Like, uh, late, yeah, seventy-nine, in fact. And um, uh, the V actually stands for Valiant, in fact. So, uh, but he didn't do it. So <laughs> others named it VP and VNP. Okay, I will I will also another more technical question. In the definition of VMP, yeah, you take the sum over just zero and ones for these advice variables Ys. However, in principle, in G, these Ys can appear to higher degree. Yes. Uh, yes. So is this necessary that they appear to higher degree? Namely, if you restrict the class to require that they appear only linearly. Uh, a, does this change the class? I mean, what was going on? That's a good point. That's a good point. So um, if we allow right now, if we allow the degrees to be high, they're equivalent to having multilinear degrees anyway, because if you just have zero one coefficients, then I mean, zero one substitutions, it doesn't matter if you're taking y square or y cube or whatever. Uh, your question is more about if I take other substitutions here and allow for high degree, does it increase the class? My feeling is no, but I don't know actually. I wouldn't think it will as long as these values still continue to be small because you can do some sort of an encoding and get away with it. Uh, but if it becomes large, then it's not clear anymore because the at least the idea I'm thinking about, which is simple encoding, will start give, giving very large degrees to these y's and so on. So not completely clear if it holds for all possible substitutions. But as long as these are small constants, I think it will be fine. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So coming to the VP versus VNP question, um, what is it? So it is about finding a polynomial which is over here, which is not over here. I haven't told you that VP is contained in VNP, but that should be easy to see because you just take M equal to zero. So there are no extra variables and then every polynomial will inside is anywhere polynomial in VP. So VP is contained in VNP. That's quite easy, but are they different? Is there a polynomial that's here, which is not inside? And uh, it is known that there exists such polynomials. So what do I mean by that? So existence versus explicit separation. This is a distinction I would like to make and it's an important one. So. Suppose I take a random polynomial. By that I mean, take all monomials that you want to have in your final polynomial. And for every polynomial, every monomial, pick its coefficient just between zero or one, toss a coin. If it comes up heads, its coefficient is one, else its coefficient is zero. So this is not an explicit polynomial because it's a random polynomial. It, it's not something I can write down. It's a process randomized algorithm that creates this polynomial, okay? And this polynomial, I mean, not, not this, but this distribution of polynomials is known to be hard, that there are no polynomial size circuits for these. But this is exactly the same as saying- Sorry, Nutan. Yeah, Anush, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I just, so why would the random polynomial give you something in VNP? Yeah, that's a very good point. So, um, uh, so there is another definition for VNP, which says that if the coefficients of 
every monomials are easy to compute. If coefficient of every monomial is easy to compute, then the polynomial is in VNP. That's another equivalent definition for polynomials in VNP, which I haven't presented here. I think what you do is just you use the y variables y1 through y n then uh, to encode a zero one thing for all the other things. Mm. Roughly. Yes and no. Uh, it requires a little bit of proof to say that the two definitions are the same. So this yeah, is it's one, okay. Yeah. This is one definition I, of I, I, I guess what I'm not seeing is I, I mean the, the random process you're describing is really a different distribution for each n. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't, I'm not, uh, I guess that's why, oh, I see. But if you, as long as you get a, a, yeah. polynomial, in, a polynomial size polynomial in the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if there is a small computation that can determine your coefficients for a polynomial, then um, let me say morally that polynomial is in VNP. It all, all of this requires a little bit of proof, but uh, that's known. So as a result, a polynomial which is chosen like this by this random process is indeed, um, it can be argued as in V and P. In fact, often this is the first way to prove the lower bound for any class in general. May it be Boolean complexity, may it be algebraic complexity, whatever. You want to say there exists hard problems. So just like uh, how Turing said that there are these uncomputable objects, right? Like so. Uh, the existence we know already. It's it's not so much like we don't know there are uh, you know computationally intractable problems. So this statement in green is that of that uh, flavor that there exist problems which are hard, and this is this is known. Yeah, but just like in the case of computation, uh, we want to come up with explicit problems which are hard. Uh, we have a similar thing here. So the problem that really the VP versus VNP question really is, does, this, does there exist an explicit polynomial um, such that it is in VNP? And any circuit computing it has size strictly more than polynomial in N. Because when it has size strictly more than polynomial in N is when it will not be in VP. We define polynomials to be in VP when they have polynomial size circuits. So to show that they are not in polynomial VP, you have to show that they have super polynomial size circuits. So then uh, would this be a good place where to make a break? Because time-wise, it's uh, we are approaching yeah. four. Yeah, yeah, sure. I It went above my expectation. Yeah, my, I mean, hi, Michael Cadillac. There you go. Okay, so we can uh, call it a break now. We can have maybe five minutes. There have been many questions during the presentation, so maybe yeah. we don't need a long uh, break of questions. But just to resynchronize with everybody, let's take now five minutes of questions. Anyway, at 10 past four, we will uh, restart with the presentation, so in uh, 13 minutes. Okay. So it's, uh, it's a compromise. But I will hang around if there are questions, so that's fine. Okay, great. Thanks. A question time. Michele has a question. Yay. Uh, hey. Hi, good morning. Hi, hi. Super nice early to see right you. here. Yeah. Um, uh, what was the question? Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's something that's always baffled me with the definition of VP and VNP is that restriction on degree. I can understand that morally you don't want high degrees, but also morally you want the circuit to do the job and whatever is the output or whatever it computes. Yeah. should be a valid VP um, uh, polynomial. So what would break really in the theory if yeah. we didn't have that syntactic restriction? Yeah, good, very good question. So uh, actually that's a, I mean, you could define a class where you know degrees are allowed to be large, but really why people do it this way is because uh, you want all of this algebraic world somewhere to collide with the Boolean world. So it's not so much that we are doing this for the aesthetics, which some people are doing for aesthetics, but, um, but also because we want to actually answer the P versus NP question. It's more like a you know, diversion because we are not able to answer the P versus NP question. So if that is what our end goal is, 
then we should really try to capture through these classes what P and NP stand for. And now, if I think about this repeated squaring uh, idea itself, I start with something which has say two bit representations. And by the end of this, as uh, you know, was pointed out, it becomes double exponential uh, in degree, which means the representations become exponentially many bits. So if I actually start, sub, start using these underlying objects, which are now syntactic objects for my purpose, to actually compute something which I care about, then it's going to start computing things which are humongous. They don't map to our understanding of what polynomial is. And it is to map to that understanding of polynomial that people say that, okay, then final represent, if I really want to finally play around with bits and compute, actually evaluate things and compute values, then I better say that the final evaluation has only poly bits. So it's, it's for that that uh, people have defined it this way. Thank you. On the other hand, on it, with, with circuits, there are two things. Right? It, the circuit can be more exponentially more succinct than the equivalent formula. And the second thing is that P slash poly contains undecidable problems. So there are caveats to the, the Boolean world too when you define uh, polynomial circuits. True, true. But I can true. understand. Yeah, true. All right. Uh, and, and do you know of any statement that would really break if we were to allow that? or Maybe the proof becomes trivial or much too hard. Yeah, because I think then the distinction between VP and VNP, even to prove that VP not equal to VNP, suddenly things which are, uh, you know, which look difficult for trivial reasons, such as, you know, having exponentially many bits in the output, these are problems which are, from the Boolean point of view, some higher levels of hierarchies and so on. They start becoming computable here in the counting hierarchy. They start becoming computable here. So it kind of maps to a very strange world, which we don't like to think about. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like that answer. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, something about the uh, comment before uh, with uh, multiplication, doubling the degree, right? And we uh, uh, had discussed this, and you would get, of course, double exponential degrees. Now, there are also in circuit theory and circuit complexity, and I, my question will then be about algebraic circuits. There are also definitions where you just limit the multiplication depth yes. of circuits. Yes. And uh, what I wanted to sort of make sure I mean uh, uh, just uh, mention is this is not an issue here, right? I mean, we are not looking at uh, the issue of bounded multiplication depth. Uh, we haven't so far, but we will soon. So yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. It is a question by Bevoy. Yeah. And so could you say um, more what is an explicit polynomial? It's not clear for me, like, yeah. if there is some random process which leads to uh, to polynomial which is not in VP, there is, you know, some yeah. polynomial. Why it's not explicit? Yeah, so explicit, I mean, like, um, so first, uh, uh, you know, like definition by example in some sense, that the first five polynomials I wrote down as example one to five, are explicit for me. Whereas a polynomial that can't be sort of written down uh, monomial by monomial is non-explicit for me. So, uh, so in that sense, an explicit polynomial is a polynomial that I can lay my hands on and write down given sufficient time. So every coefficient of every monomial is a priori known. But okay, but if there is a random process, which you know what I mean, there exists some polynomials, so yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. we cannot. So, what's the difference? I, I mean, I'm the impression that there may be a bit of confusion like the separation is not a single polynomial, it would be a family of polynomials, right? Yeah, so the random process can give you a single polynomial, but what really a separation here is needed, it's a family of polynomials, right? So, yeah. 
all these examples, one till four, uh, they were um, families of polynomials, in fact. Uh -huh. That's a good point, yeah. So, okay, uh, it's still not clear for me. So what's... Okay, uh, so what for example, um, uh, here, I mean, just from the Boolean complexity analogy, uh, I would say that, or even from computational uh, co computing uh, theory analogy, um, the diagonalization proof is a proof which is existential to me. And saying that halting problem is not computable is an explicit example of a problem that's not computable. So just saying that there are more languages than there are Turing machines is uh, being non-explicit in my world. And then saying that this is a problem, halting problem, that's not computable by any Turing machine. That's an explicit example for me. Or, um, so I could do this with every model of computation, actually. And in the algebraic world, then what it means is to say that, oh, these are all the algebraic objects of polynomial size, and there exists something which is larger than uh, this that is not computable by her. It's just a counting argument, or it's like information theory argument. And that's not an explicit separation because it's not letting me lay my hands on a family, as uh, uh, you were rightly saying, family of polynomials that are hard to compute. But is it is it yeah uh, like you are describing intuition, right? Uh, I'm, I'm describing the nature of the problem we are trying to attack. Mm -hmm. We are not trying to attack a problem which is, do there exist polynomials which are hard to compute by polynomial size objects? The answer to that is a yes. But that's not the VP versus VNP question. If that were, we have solved it already. What's VP versus VNP question? Give an explicit polynomial where, you know, every monomial coefficient I can write down for every uh, n, for every slice of that polynomial family. And for that polynomial family, prove that it is not computable. Yeah, so uh, Newton, what is uh, sort of, the, uh, uh, in a sense, the best lower bounds for algebraic circuits? Yeah, I will. I will come to that. In uh... you will. Okay, so uh, I retract my question. Okay. I will. I will get there. Yes. Of course. Let me uh, interrupt here because I would like to restart in about five minutes. So maybe it's a good moment to stop uh, taking questions. So to let everybody following closely this conversation to have a little break, which may be useful also for the speaker. So I propose to come back here in three or four minutes uh, and, uh, and resume the presentation. I myself will disappear as well for three or four minutes.